So again, I like to say that I'm uh, glad to see you here, and uh, glad again to see uh, I say new faces uh, appearing each lost day. We see the Ang family uh, this coming week. Uh, now, someone asked me whether the word "welcome" is appropriate uh, to put on the screen to welcome you, and I think that it is most appropriate because we do welcome you, right, to come together. In fact, we welcome each other. We are thinking who welcomes who. I think we welcome each other here to worship the Lord. Now, it's been a stressful weeks for me, and the reason is because whenever there is, whenever we come to the end of a series, I have to think of a new series. So I do uh, request your prayer. I am not settled yet as to what I'm going to preach on or, the, or what series I'm going to begin. So we have just ended uh, our series on uh, Hebrews 11. Now it is not exactly accurate to say the series is called Hebrews 11 because we have uh, cover also chapter 12 and the first four verses, which rightly belong to Hebrews chapter 11. Okay. Otherwise, there is no conclusion. Remember, Hebrews 12, verse 1 begins with therefore, and so that was the conclusion. So before uh, we begin a new series, I thought maybe this week and maybe next week, I will try to cover something else. And I thought this morning is most appropriate. We try to finish a series that we were doing uh, before the MCO. If you still remember what we were studying, we were doing the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. And we have not finished yet. One more commandment to go, right? We have done all the other nine. And so today we shall look at the last of the Ten Commandments. Now, let me perhaps uh, recap a little, just in case you have forgotten, and also for those who perhaps didn't join us in that series, to know what the series is about, or to know what the Ten Commandments uh, are about. You see, the Ten Commandments, they are a summary of God's moral law. Uh, we know that in the Old Testament, there are three kinds of laws. We have the ceremonial laws, of the people of God regarding to the dietary laws and, and, and things like that. And then we have the civil law that governs them as a nation. And then we have the moral law. Now the ceremonial and the civil law belong to that era. Right? And so they are no longer uh, concerned uh, concern us. But the moral laws of God are forever in a sense they are God's holy standard for his creation and so that concerns us and that's why we are studying the Ten Commandments. Now the Ten Commandments they are also divided into two groups or two categories or we call it two tables of the Ten Commandments. So the first table uh, concerns or is about our duty towards God well, that is commandment one to four. And the other table concerns our duty towards our fellow men. And that is commandment five to ten. And Jesus sum up, right, sum this up into two great commandments, if you might remember, right? And the first is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, right? And the second great commandment is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you see all this kind of sum up the Ten Commandments. All right, so that is in general what the Ten Commandments are about. So we have covered the first nine. Today we look at the tenth. So what is the tenth commandment? Let us again look at what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. So we have the Tenth Commandment uh, recorded here in verse 17. So I shall read that again. It says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, 
nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So that is the 10th commandment. So what is the 10th commandment about? I'm sure we are all familiar uh, with the 10th commandment. So what is the 10th commandment about? I think we see that uh, very clearly when we look at what is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5, right? Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now remember, uh, Deuteronomy 5 is when Moses was uh, g- giving the law again, or what we call the second reading of the law. Right? And here, again, uh, repeating the tenth commandment, or the ten commandments. Now look at the way the tenth commandment is being uh, mentioned here, all right, in verse 21 of Deuteronomy chapter 5. So look at the wordings, uh, the same commandment. Now you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now there is a word, right, uh, that seems to be, uh, seems kind of different from the one in Exodus 20 in verse 17, and that word is desire. All right, so you see there, in verse 21, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And then Moses said, and you shall not desire. You shall not desire. And so that is what the 10th commandment is about. It is about desire. And so you shall not covet means you shall not desire. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, or wife, or donkey, or servants. Now, we have desires. We love things. I have desires. I love, in fact, I love Uncle Yap's house, right? Nice setting, right, in his house. I, I, I love his farm, right? I, I love Uncle Taheng's car, right? I have desire, right? So you think about desire, that's what we are talking about. Desires, you love this thing, you love that house, you love that car, and things like that. Now, coveting is about desires. Coveting is what I would call here this morning a sin of desire. And so these two words, in a sense, is used here interchangeably by Moses. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and then he said you shall not desire your neighbor's house. I hope I'm not coveting, right? I mentioned those houses and cars, right? And so we need to study this commandment here and so that we do not sin this sin. So coveting is about desire. And there are three important truths about this desire that I want to show you, right? That I want to show you uh, about this uh, commandment. So number one, coveting is a sinful desire. Yes, coveting is about desire. It's not just any desire, but coveting is a sinful desire. Because coveting is a sinful desire, we must avoid coveting. We must avoid this kind of desire. And so we say it is a sin of desire. Now put another way, coveting is not a sin of action. It's not a sin of doing is a sin of desiring. Now, for example, we see in the other commandments that those are sins of doing when you kill somebody, this acting is doing, or when you steal somebody's thing, right? Or you commit adultery. Now, that, that is action, right? But coveting is not a sin of doing, but a sin of wanting, a sin of wanting to have things, right? Wanting to have things. So do you have desires? As we study this, Commandment, we ask ourselves, do we have desires? Desires to eat. We're going to eat afterward. Do you have desire to eat? Okay, we put down the list there. What do you desire to eat? Big, big wonton, all right? Or you want fried laksa? Or you want fish head noodle? Or you want musang king as a dessert, all right? Desire. Do, do, you, do you have desire? Do you desire for handphones? Do you have desire for handphones? 
maybe some of you might say, oh, I have no desire for handphones, only iPhones, right? Do you have desires for handbags? Do you have desire for holidays or sports or K-pop? Now, as we mentioned one by one, all these things, we know that this is something that we all struggle with because we all have desires, right? For this or for that thing. But I'd like to uh, at least point this out that not to worry because desires are not necessarily wrong right? of themselves, right? Uh, for example, right? When you read Proverbs chapter 18, Proverbs chapter 18, and you read uh, verse uh, 22, and this is what Solomon says. Uh, what does he say? Well, in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22, uh, he says that he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So if you desire a wife, now the Bible says that that is a good thing desire, right? That is a good thing. And so not all desires are wrong, right? So we have to at least clarify that at the outset. But desires can become wrong. Now, all desire in and of themselves are not necessarily wrong, but they can become wrong. Desires become sinful when you desire more than you should. Desire becomes wrong when you know, it, it overtakes you, it controls you. And that is what we call coveting, right? That's what we call coveting, when you desire more than you should. And so we must therefore say coveting is an insatiable desire. In fact, that is how Thomas Watson puts it. He say it is an insatiable desire of getting the world. Now that is so much uh, very much our, our, our tendency as, as human in this world. That insatiable desire to get the whole world. And therefore, Jesus, you remember, once warned the people, and he says, this, and what do you gain if you gain the whole world? And so he knows that that is what people have this tendency to do. Right? We want to gain the whole world and get as much as possible. As much as possible. So coveting is, is that kind of desire, desire, or some say it, it is what I call an in ordinate desire or ungoverned desire, uncontrollable desire. Now that, that is what coveting is about. And the Bible has so much to say about this sin, this tendency of, of people. And listen to Jesus, for example, in, the, in, in Luke chapter 12, where he warns people of, of this sin, of this danger in their life. Now in, in Luke chapter 12, and here in verse 13, we have someone coming to Jesus and talking about money. It says here, Then one from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide my divide the inheritance with me, or to share that, that, that inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him in verse 14, Men who make me a judge or arbitrator over you, and then he said to them, now not just to this person, but to all the others, and say, look, this is the great danger when people talk about money, when people talk about inheritance. It's really a great danger. He said to them, take heed. Be careful. Take heed and beware of what? Covetousness. You see, immediately Jesus understand the problem of these people, the problem of inordinate desires for possession. He said, take heed of this covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Why is that people are covetous? Why is that people want so much? Because they think that that is what their life is all about. Life is about possession. If I have no money, I've got no meaning in life. And that's why people are prepared to take their life when they lose money. They lose an investment, they will jump on the 15th floor down. And they say there's no more purpose to live on. If they don't get what they want, you see, they get, they get depressed. Jesus says, you know what? You got it all wrong. You think that this is what life is all about. And that is covetousness. And Jesus warns against that. And so, and so that is uh, the first thing we need to understand about this desire, right? It is not just desire, but it is a sinful desire, inordinate desire, ungoverned desire, insatiable desire. 
where a desire controls you. A desire controls you. So that is the first thing. The second thing, right? The second thing about this desire called covetousness is that covetousness is not only a sinful desire, it is also a deadly desire. It is a deadly desire. In other, in other words, now do not think that covetousness is a small, harmless sin. Now people can see why the other sin is, is big, right? Why, why the other sins are, are big sins. For example, they know that, oh, you must not murder, you must not kill. That, that is huge, right? We really have to punish people if you kill somebody else. And that's why we have capital punishment. And uh, if you rob other people, we feel that, oh, that, that is bad. Or you commit adultery, oh, oh that is bad. But coveting? You see, we, we don't really care a lot about covetousness. People who are greedy, people who really want a lot of things, a lot of their desire controls them. We don't think a lot about this. We, should we punish these people for being covetous? We what kind of punishment? Oh, maybe the lawyers can think about uh, when you know, you know punishments that meets the crime or what kind of punishment? Slaughter them, kill them, execute them. Now, you see, I say, the tendency is that we don't think much about covetousness, thinking that it is perhaps some small, little, harmless sin. But let me point out here that the Tenth Commandment is not an anticlimax. In other words, you know, as you know, we read or study this commandment one by one, we are seeing all these big commandments or a big sin, and then we come to the last one, it's an anticlimax. Oh, Moses oh, just mentioned a small sin here. No, it is not. Rather, coveting or covetousness is in the same league as those big sins. Now, I think we need to get that into our mind, that covetousness belongs to that same league, right? It's like all the other sins. And we see that is the way the Bible puts it. When you read your Bible, don't you get a sense that covetousness belongs to that league? Oh, you don't. Well, maybe let us find out, right, from the scripture. Let's perhaps listen to Jesus and how Jesus understands uh, covetousness in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And look again, uh, look at uh, verses 21 and 22. Mark chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Now, Jesus said, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds what? Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. So you see, in Jesus' mind, covetousness is included in this list of sins that include other things like murders and adulteries and, and so on. And so he didn't miss this out. He didn't miss mentioning covetousness. To him, he says, this is huge. This is a big thing. This is a deadly sin, right? This is a big sin. Or oh, when you read Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and again we see how he understands covetousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And here in verses 9 and 10, verses 9 and 10, now he says to the Corinthians, they, they, they were no strangers to sin, right? They, have, they were familiar with sins. Just like we, right? when we say the Corinthians, oh, Corinthians, sinful city, oh, Corinthians, you know, the, the word Corinthians means like sin and, 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 and adultery and fornication and things like that as if we are not the same. We are familiar with sin. And Paul tells them, your family may sin, let me tell you about sin and the danger. Now, it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient just to be familiar with sin. Oh, we all know sin. But are you aware? Do you know the danger so that you don't play, play with sin? No, we don't. All right? we, we dare to sin. We dare to sin. Listen to Paul, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous 
will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomite, nor thieves, nor what? Nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, listen very carefully to what Paul is saying here. First, he includes covetousness into this group of sins that includes things like homosexuals and, and adulterers and, and so on. He says it belongs to this same league. It is a big sin. That is one. And second, just as we understand why this big sin will prevent us from entering heaven and why this big sin will send us to hell, so also, and that is what he's saying, do not be deceived. Neither the covetous will enter into the kingdom of God. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm not a murderer. Oh, I don't rob banks. And therefore, I'm safe. Are you covetous? Do you have this sinful desire? You know what this sin can send you to hell. That's what he's telling the Corinthians here. right? And so from what Jesus said and from the words of the Apostle Paul, now, now we see that the Tenth Commandment is not an anticlimax. It is a big sin. It belongs to the big league, as it were. And we see that in the teaching of the Bible. All right, so that is the first thing, that it is not a small sin. In fact, now let me add here, that it is not just a big sin, but it is a deadly sin. Now, you see, we need to kind of and, and think more carefully about, more deeply about this, this sin called covetousness. That it is deadly, not harmless, not small sin and not harmless sin. It is a very, very harmful sin. How so? How so? Well, it is a sin that will lead to many other sins. All right? It is deadly because it is a sin that will lead to many other sins. In fact, we might call it, it is the mother of all sins. It is the mother of all sins. Look at two examples, right? First, in 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. Right, some of you are familiar with this story, some perhaps not so, but let me just begin with verse 14 and I'll tell you the, set, the, the context. Right? So, uh, 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 14, and here we read that they sent to Jezebel, the wife of uh, Ahab, right, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. Now, so what happens here is, is that they kill Naboth. Now, question is, Why? They did something. They killed somebody. Question is, why? Why is Neboth dead or being killed? Well, the reason is this. Because we read in the context in verse 1 that it came to pass after these things that Neboth, the just real like, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Herod, Ahab, king of Samaria. And so that is the context here, that, that Neboth has a piece of land and like some might say, ah, bad luck, all right? Just happened that his land is next to Ahab's land or Ahab's palace. And Ahab, the, the, the king, uh, wanted that piece of land. In other words, Ahab had this covetous heart. He wants his neighbor's land. Now, you know what the Ten Commandments say? Thou shall not covet your neighbor's things, right? Donkey or ox and land. And, and so here is the sin of covetousness. He wanted that land and he wanted that neighbor's land so badly and it ends up killing Naboth. Now, now you can see why covetousness is a deadly sin. It can lead to murder. You know, it, it's not his intention to kill Naboth. So you see, it is not a sin of doing, it's a sin of desiring, but it leads to doing. It leads to killing here. Another example, in 2 Samuel, right, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, here of course is probably a more well-known uh, example here. Now 2 Samuel chapter 11, 
Uh, again, let me just read verses 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 14 says, In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So here is a scheme, a plan by, by, by David to have Uriah killed. Question is, why? David, why, why do you want to kill this innocent man? Covetousness. Because we are told in the context, uh, in the beginning of the chapter, that he saw Uriah's wife and he wants his neighbor's wife. He wants his neighbor's wife. That is what the Ten Commandments is about. Thou shall not, you shall not desire or covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's land, your neighbor's house, your neighbor's car. Because when you have that evil desire, the sinful desire in you, it is a deadly desire because that desire so overwhelm you, so controls you, you become, you become ungoverned like these people and leads to heinous sin. It leads to heinous sin. And, and, and that is a, that, that's why this, this is a big thing, right? This is a big sin. Now we know that sinful deeds begins with a sinful heart, right? Sinful desire. It, it begins inside. And, and that's what we saw earlier on, right? Oh, Jesus said, for out of the heart, it begins inside. And that is constantly emphasized, emphasized in the scripture. Uh, James says the same thing, right? In, in James chapter 1. Uh, which he kind of uh, put it in a pictorial form, right? In James chapter 1, uh, verses 14 and 15, and, and listen to what he says. He, he says in verse 14, James 1, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Now that, that is covetousness. He's his Drawn away by his own desire. Then, verse 15, Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So it's like one thing leading on to another. So beware of covetousness. It will lead to heinous sin. It leads to all kinds of troubles. Or in James chapter 4, James chapter Four verses one and two, where James asked the question: Where do wars and fight come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war within your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war. Why all this fight? Why all this conflict? Desires, the heart, the covetous heart, right? So it leads to all kinds of troubles. And, and therefore, Paul warns. Now, you see, there are plenty of warnings of covetousness, of this sinful desire that can be a deadly desire. In the Bible, listen to Paul in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. Right? And verse 9. And Paul again warns here. His warning is this, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drowns men in destruction and perdition. Can you hear the warning here? Desire, those who desire to be rich fall into all kinds of temptations, harmful lusts, draws men into perdition and destruction. It is destructive. It is deadly. And so, covetousness right, is no small sin. Right? It is a deadly sin. Now, that leads us to the third thing we should know about this desire. Right? The third thing we should know about this desire. And that is the root. The root of this desire. What is it about? All about the root of it is discontentment with God. The root of this desire is discontentment with God. So, in other words, at the heart of this sin is 
the unwillingness to be satisfied with God and with what he has given to us. Now, this is a great danger. I'm not talking about outside, talking about us. That we are not satisfied with God himself and with what he is giving to us every day. In fact, we should be counting our blessings. We should be praising God as we come together in worship. That should be the spirit. That should be the attitude. We come feeling, having, knowing, having this sense of unworthiness, feeling so blessed because we have God and we have so much of his blessing. All right. And, and so that is the root of this desire, this contentment with God. Now let me ask, what really is contentment? What is contentment? Now, Paul tells us, Paul knows contentment. And he tells us what true contentment is in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And let me here read verse, from verse 10 onwards. Philippians 10, uh, Philippians 4 and verse 10, Paul says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely declare, but you lack opportunity. And so Paul is very happy. He, he rejoiced again that uh, Philippi Christians were sharing with him their blessing. They were giving him gifts, all right? And then he says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now that is contentment. Whatever state I am in, I am happy, I am satisfied, I am content. Verse 12. For I know how to be a base, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer needs. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, sometimes people think verse 13 means that when we have Jesus Christ on our side or with us, we can carry heavy bags. I can do all things. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about contentment. He's talking about contentment. That I can be happy in any state because I have learned how to be content. Now that is true uh, contentment. Now what is the secret of contentment? What is the secret of it? Well, Hebrews chapter 13 tells us, right, Hebrews 13 and uh, verse 5. Now here, here's the secret of contentment. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 uh, says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Without covetousness. Uh, that is what the he Hebrew writer tells us. Be content with such things as you have. Now, as we study the Tenth Commandment, that is what we need to learn. To learn what the writer is saying, let your conduct be without covetousness and be contained with such thing as you have. But what is the secret of it? Well, he continues. For God himself has said. Said what? Now, this is a secret. That we know that God has said something, but said what? Oh, is it because, because he has given this and that to you and he will give more, therefore be content. Don't worry, God will give more to you. No, that is not a secret. The secret of contentment is not to know that God will give us, will give me more because he has given me so much. Now here's the secret. He says, For God himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That is the secret of contentment. God is saying that you have me. You have me. Is that enough? It's for a lot of Christians, that is not enough. Yeah, God, I have you, but I don't have yours. I want things. I don't want you. God says, I will never leave you. Listen to mommy telling us, child, I will never leave you. For the child, that is enough. Mommy, don't leave me. Are we like this? That is the secret of true contentment. Or in the words of the psalmist, or in the words of the psalmist in Psalms 73, Psalms 73, the secret of true contentment is this. Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. The psalmist says, Whom have I in heaven but you? 
and there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is the source of my strength. He is my portion forever. Whom have I in heaven but you? God, it is you. If I have you, I have everything. That is enough. Again, again, listen to Paul. Paul, as I say, is a person who really knows contentment and he knows the secret. Listen to his words here. But what things were gained to me? These I counted lost for Christ. Yes, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. You know the problem about covetousness coming with us, wanting this thing and that thing, never happy in our life because they have not found the treasure, have not understood what Jesus really means. For Paul, he knows when he found Christ, he's like the man who found the priceless pearl. He's like the man who found the treasure hidden in the ground. Found Christ. That is more than enough. That, that I'm prepared to give up anything, everything else, that I may have him. Now that is the secret of true contentment. And therefore, we might say, the root of covetousness is discontentment with God, right? It's discontentment with God, where God is not enough, where God is not our treasure. We want to replace him with something else. Something else has become more important. Something else has become more precious. Something else has become more desirable and more satisfying to you. That's why you are covetous. And now, we understand what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 5. Now listen to what he says. Ephesians Chapter 5 and verse 5, Paul says, For this you know, that no fornicators, unclean person, or covetous man. What is a covetous man? Now listen to what he said. No covetous man who is an idolater. You are an idol worshipper if you are a covetous person. Listen again, he says, None of these people has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now he 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 never he say he, he said he never fails to try to impress upon them that upon the, the the people that he was writing to that if you are covetous you do not belong to the kingdom of God. There's no place in heaven for a covetous person. Why? Because God is not your treasure. Because Jesus is not first place in your life. Listen to him again. Paul in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornications, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and what? Covetousness, which is what? Which is idolatry. A covetous person is an idol worshipper. He is not worshipping the true and living God. He is worshipping something else. He is worshipping cash. He is worshipping career. He is worshipping his wife, his children. He is worshipping his status. He is worshipping his education. He is worshipping something else. Something else is number one in his life. That's why he is pursuing this other thing and not satisfied with God. And so at the end of the second reading of the law in Deuteronomy 5, which I turned to you, turned to your attention earlier on in Deuteronomy 5, where, where there is the second reading of the law, Moses quoted God as saying this in the verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29. Oh, that they have such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my, my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. I want you to take note of what he says here. 
Verse 29 says, Oh, that they had such a heart. Such a heart. This commandment is about the heart. This commandment is asking the question, where is your heart? Or what is in your heart? Well, that depends. That depends. Because Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where is your heart? That depends on where, what is your treasure? Is it God or mammon? Is it God or mammon? And that's what the challenge that Jesus put his disciples. Where is your heart? Depends on what your treasure is. So I want to ask you this morning, as we think about this commandment, where is your heart? And what is your treasure? Just as God's interest is in Israel's heart, his interest is in our heart. You must have no other gods before me. Remember, that is how the Decalogue starts. It seems like that is how it ends. It's back to commandment number one. Commandment number one, do you have other gods beside him? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. Otherwise, you will be covetous. You will go for other gods. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this opportunity to regather and to come back to this series to complete it, to look at your holy laws and your demands of us and how we ought to live our life as your creatures to love you with all our hearts and all our soul and all our strength and all our mind and to love our neighbors as ourselves help us we know that by ourselves it's impossible for us to keep these laws help us that we might glorify you and honor you by the way we live our life for we pray all this in jesus name amen